it's time for another amazing chemistry video with Mr. Stapleton. Grab this one, sit back, I'm doing a nice coffee. Hi guys, welcome to the next video on the managing resources topic. Uh, this is 4.2 and it's going to be all about water. <clears throat> a little bit of background around water, it covers 71% of the Earth's surface and is probably the most abundant resource that we have. Um, and the treatment method for making the water usable for us, obviously we need it for a whole bunch of different purposes. So we use it for um, agriculture, obviously drinking, cleaning, um, using a lot of chemical reactions that we need um, water as well. Um, so the treatment processes that we use depends on where the water comes from and what it will be used for. Um, <clears throat> now you might have um, some questions around what good quality water is. Um, well, here's the answer for you. That's what I call high quality H2O. So, in order to get water that is clean, cold and crisp, uh, we need to go through a couple of different chemical processes. Uh, the first one is what we call flocculation. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more detail in a minute. Uh, we're going to go through sedimentation and we're going to go through filtration as well. So, um, like I said, depending upon where the water comes from, depends on which of the processes you need to use. Um, and we're going to look at each one in depth. So what you need to have an understanding around is what sort of things we normally find in water. So if you're looking at a water filtration plant, we've got lots of them around um, Adelaide here. Um, the first step always, it's kind of like a um, just a getting rid of the biggest things first and then working your way down to the smallest things. Uh, so what they'll have is they'll have big grates which um, stop big like floating sticks and plastic bags and all those sorts of things from going um, into the water treatment plant and then from that they'll slowly start to work down um, through the size of the particles that are in the water to get rid of them. So once you get right down towards the small end of it, these are the sorts of things you're going to find in there. You're going to find sand particles, silt particles, and clay particles. Now you can see the size difference. Um, obviously sand particles aren't that big. This is a relative size thing. Um, so sand particles, which is silicon dioxide, okay, um, they are um, big three-dimensional network structures. Okay, um, You can normally filter those out by filtration, all right? so that's not too much of an issue. Uh, silt particles, same sort of thing. Clay particles are so small that normal filtration um, doesn't actually get rid of them. Uh, if you try to make your filter um, so small that it will get rid of the clay particles, it won't allow your water to flow through. Okay. The other problem is that clay particles don't settle to the bottom. Normally if you get some, if you get dirt or something like that and you mix it in water, after a while what it will do is it will settle to the bottom. And then that's not an issue, you can just um, decant or pour off the liquid off the top. Um, clay particles though, because they're negatively charged, you can see over here, um, they're silicates, so they um, have negative charges on them. They repel each other in the water, so they don't, um, what they call, flock together. Okay, that's um, the term we use for when particles come together. It's called flocculation, like birds. When they come together, they form a flock of birds. Uh, similar sort of thing with chemistry. Because they're negatively charged, they repel each other. They don't form a flock, which means they don't get heavy enough to settle to the bottom where we can remove them. So there's a couple of different things that we can do in order to overcome that. Uh, the first process is uh, what we call coagulation. So to overcome the repulsion, uh, we put in salts containing highly charged cations. Okay, aluminiums are a really good example of this. Uh, so it's got a high um, charge density. Okay, and what we've got is we've got the surface of our silicates here, which are repelling each other. We add in our highly charged cations. They neutralise the surface of the silicates. There's no charge, which means there's now therefore no repulsion. What will happen is that these particles now, because there's no repulsion, they'll start to attract to each other and they'll form one big clump in the middle. That clump becomes heavier and it sinks to the bottom and we can filter it out. Alum, um, which is uh, aluminium sulfate, is normally what we use if we want to um, put in something for aluminium. Uh, one thing that's started to be tested these days as well now is the use of uh, large polymers. Now these large polymers have these little special areas okay, um, which have positive charges on them. I haven't drawn them here, but there's positive charges on the polymer here. And what happens is you can see you've got these little sites in here that because they're um, positive, they attract the negative clay particles. And not only do they attract them and neutralize the charge, but they actually trap the clay particle as well. So when you remove your polymer, you remove the clay with it as well. So you're kind of doing your filtration and um, neutralization all in one step. Um, so that's quite a good um, benefit that they're doing now. 
So once we've got all those particles which are now being neutrally charged, they come together to form um, a clumped particle. Those flocks are now much heavier, so they settle to the bottom and can be removed by filtration, which is really, really beneficial. Cleaning agents um, are something that we add to water when we want to improve the cleaning quality of the water. Now water is obviously a polar molecule, um, but a lot of the things that we use, such as oils, fats, um, okay, grease, they are all non-polar molecules, they're based on hydrocarbon structures. So what that means is that they won't dissolve in water, so you could wash something that's got an oil stain on it, you could wash it for two weeks and you wouldn't get the oil off because the um, polar water molecule will be repelled by the non-polar um, oil molecule. So what we do is we add in something called surfactants. Now surfactants are surface active agents. That means they act at the surface of things and they help clean it. Surfactants all have this common structure here. They have a, a polar, what's called hydrophilic. So um, hydro is water and the philic is a Greek word, um, from, comes from the Greek word philia, which means love. All right. Hydrophobic comes from the Greek um, phobia or fear. So it's a fear or hate of water, and this one's a love of water. So these, because it's polar, will be attracted to the water. This, because it's non-polar, will be attracted to the hydrocarbons, which is really good. So now you've got something that will bond to both polar and non-polar species. Okay. So the non-polar tail is really good at attracting itself to grease, dirts, fats, and oils. All right, by either dispersion or dipole-dipole bonding. So what we do is we get, and this is an example of one here, um, we have a long fatty acid, okay, um, so it's between like 12 to 20 carbon atoms, we've got a um, carboxylic acid group on the end, okay, and um, how we prepare them is we take a triglyceride here, which is a fat or an oil, okay, we add sodium hydroxide, we get glycerol or propane 1, 2, 3 triol, and our sodium um, acid here, which is our soap. Right. The good thing about having the sodium ion is that makes it water soluble because you've got a really, really long carbon chain here. Um, and so you need to actually make sure you have a um, polar head group here with the sodium in it to make it water soluble. This non-polar tail is what will be attracted to the grease and oil, and this will be attracted to the water by iron dipole interactions. Uh, you look at this probably in the organic section around triglycerides, so hopefully it's nothing new for you as well. Obviously to go from this to this, they add a number of things in, they add fragrances, they add colour, um, they add moisturiser, um, so they add a number of things to actually make the soap more appealing, but this is the actual surface active agent that will get rid of any of this um, dirt or oil particles. So to have a look at the, what's actually happening, this blue here is the soap particle, and this um, pink here is the dirt or oil particle which is attached to the surface of our material. So this could be um, a plate, um, could be clothes, could be anything. So the first step is uh, what's called penetration or bonding, basically. So the non-polar tail needs to attach itself to the um, non-polar greased dirt oil fat molecule that's on the surface. Like I said, does it via um, dipole dipole or more commonly dispersion bonding. Once we've got all these bonds formed, okay, um, you think about how if you're washing the dishes, okay, um, if you just put the plate into the water and take it out, you don't get rid of the dirt and oil particles on the surface. What you've got to do is scrub at it, and that is the second step, which is agitation. So agitation means to stir up, okay, so you, by stirring it up, what you're doing is you're breaking the uh, small amount of um, attraction between the dirt or fat oil particle and the surface here, and you're now causing these um, soap particles with the fat or oil attached to come off the surface and float in solution. Now what's going to happen is that these are all non-polar, all right, and you've got to remember all around this is polar water molecules. So these are hating the, um, the polar water molecules that are around them, so these non-polar tails are all going to attract each other. And that's what we call micelle formation. So you can see in the middle, we've got all the non-polar tails which are in the middle. Um, so we're creating a big non-polar section here. And around the outside, sorry that the picture isn't so great. I used a program to draw these up and um, the um, quality of the pictures come out. Isn't that great? These are your carboxyl head groups, your COO minus. Okay. So these um, COO minus, which I'll just draw over here. So COO minus. Okay. They... Um, uh, polar, all right, and you remember you've got the sodiums on here which have come off. These will be attracted to the water, so this is surrounded by a water molecule. Okay. The 
The next step is what we call deflocculation. So remember when we went through um, getting rid of the clay particles, we wanted them to flock together. In this case here, we don't want all of our oils and fats and everything like that to clump together when we're cleaning our dishes or cleaning our clothes because you just get a massive pile of fat and oil on the surface or you have to clean it out of your washing machine. That wouldn't be good. So in this case, what we want is we want deflocculation. We want the negative micelles to keep repelling each other and that keeps the oils and fats suspended in the water. So that when you drain out your sink or you drain out your washing machine, um, the oil and fat particles go with it and leave your clothes nice and clean. So that's the general principle of um, surfactants and that applies for both soaps and detergents. They still kind of factor um, or work both the same way. The problem with soaps though is that um, they don't remove fats and oils, that means they don't lather, um, when there's hard water around. What happens is that these um, higher charge density ions, so calcium, magnesium, iron, um, or ferrous ions and ferric ions, have got a higher charge density than sodium, so they actually replace the sodium head here. Remember we said the benefit of having the sodium head here was it makes it water soluble? Okay. Uh, when you take out that sodium there and turn it into a calcium salt, this now becomes water insoluble. And so you'll notice this if you use soap um, in your bathroom. Um, what you'll uh, see is that after a while you get a bit of a soap scum or a precipitate um, on the, um, in your shower or on the basin, and that's from this calcium um, or magnesium uh, precipitate. Here in um, South Australia, in Adelaide, we have um, quite hard water, uh, which contains quite a lot of calcium and magnesium. We don't soften it as much as um, some other states, and so um, we do have a problem with some scum formation. So um, what we're looking to do is to try and obviously re uh, reduce that um, hard water formation because obviously it reduces the effectiveness of our soaps, means we have to use more of it and that also obviously has monetary issues. So what we um, some of the modern uh, things that we're using are things called zeolites and they're silicates or aluminosilicate structures used to soften water. So this is an example of one um, with the silicon in the middle here, so these sort of pale coloured ones is a silicon, all right, and then these red ones on the outside are oxygens. So we've created this big structure here and you can see it's porous. So we've got all these holes in the middle which um, increases the surface area and where the water can come into contact and the surface of these um, zeolites have sodium ions bound on them. So these are silicates which have negative charge and they've got sodiums on the surface and they have so many sodium ions on there that what we do is that we actually um, do a cation exchange and remove the calcium and magnesium ions in the water and replace them with sodium. Okay, so when water passes through the zeolite, you can see here we've got calcium and magnesium ions in the water. Here's our zeolites, these yellow balls, all right, with the sodium ions on the surface. What happens is because the calcium and magnesium have a higher charge density, they get attracted to the silicates and they displace the sodium ions from the surface. So what happens is we do an exchange. So this is basically um, uh, ion exchange chromatography in a sense, um, similar to what we looked at in the um, first topic. And so we're exchanging the um, sodium ions on the surface for the calcium magnesium ions in water. And you can see the water we're getting out at the bottom here is all sodium ions. So it's much softer water, and so it won't form that scum uh, with the soap when we use it. What happens is that eventually you can see here the um, zeolites get completely coated with calcium and magnesium ions and so what we do um, is we stop the flow of normal water through there and what we put in is supercharged brine. Now brine is um, saturated sodium chloride solution. So basically what we do is we just saturate this with sodium ions to the point where it forces all the calcium and magnesium back out of it. We get rid of that salty water which now has the calcium and magnesium in it. We've got sodium ions back on the surface of the zeolite and we can soften water again. Um, here's this, uh, what's showing here. So here's the um, zeolites that have the um, calcium magnesium ions on the surface. Here's the new sodium ions coming in and we just replace um, the surface of all the, um, the sodium on the surface so we can use it again for water softening. Now one of the other things that's been used quite a lot and um, hopefully you get an opportunity to go down and see the new um, water desalination plant at Lonsdale here in South Australia. Um, massive cost but I'm going to go through just um, what actually happens in, uh, there. 
So they use a process called reverse osmosis in order to purify the water. Um, to understand reverse osmosis, you need to first understand what osmosis is. So osmosis is where you have a semi-permeable membrane. So what that means is you have something that allows um, some ions to flow through it um, and um, other molecules or ions can't flow through it. Now what happens is that uh, a solvent spontaneously moves through um, to the, uh, from the less concentrated side to the more concentrated side. Okay, so what I've got an example of here is we've got some pure water here and we've got salty water here. Okay, the process of osmosis says that this um, less concentrated um, so, so this has no sodium chloride in this, this is less concentrated. This is going to flow over to this side to try and make this less concentrated. Okay, so we're trying to equal it up in a sense, all right, by making this side less concentrated. You can see what happens to the water level here, it rises, here it decreases as some of the water molecules move through. Okay, the sodium chloride salt particles are too big, so they can't go back through the membrane here, only the smaller water molecules can. And that's the purpose of a semi-permeable membrane. You only want small molecules to go through, not large ones to go back. Okay, um, now what happens in reverse osmosis is obviously, funnily enough, the reverse. Okay, what we do um, is we put pressure on the more highly concentrated side. So as we put pressure on this highly concentrated side, as you compress the water, the pure water molecules are going to go back through the semi-permeable membrane. Remember, your sodium chloride isn't um, concentrated. I uh, sorry, it is too big to go through your membrane, and so the sodium chloride stays here and becomes a very um, concentrated, what we call brine solution, so a sodium chloride solution, and we end up with pure water over on this side. And so what they do at the desal plant at Lonsdale is they have special machines set up where they pressurise salt water. As they pressurise the salt water, the pure water flows into um, the other side to join other pure water, and we get water that we can use. It's called potable water. Okay, that's um, potable water is water that we can use. Okay, um, this is called desalination, removal of salt from water, which is why it's called a desalination plant. So I'll just finish this video with a little bit of info about the desal plant. Hopefully you'll be able to go and look at it. So here's a picture inside um, of the desal plant. You can see the big pipes that's bringing the salt water in. Um, okay, it was opened on the 26th of March in 2013. It costs $1.83 billion to build, which I can't even get my head around. And um, for the first um, couple of years, um, there was a fairly major drought issue in South Australia, so it was operating at quite a high level. But now with, um, we've had better rain and everything in recent times, so it's only operating, operating about 10% power, so about 5 gigalitres of water a year. Okay. It uses that reverse osmosis we've used to purify the water, as we've talked about, and it converts about 48.5% of the water it comes through um, into potable water or drinkable water. Now, obviously, there are some disadvantages, and hopefully the first one you can see is that it costs a large amount of energy um, to just firstly build the plant, but then also to um, produce the potable water. Okay, um, You need to um, obviously have containers which can um, hold the high pressure, Okay, to create that pressure, you need to uh, normally use electricity, and that obviously can contribute to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, one of the other problems is that that salty water that's left over in that brine, um, you've got to get rid of that somehow. Now, a lot of people say, well, can't you just put that back into the ocean? But that's a lot saltier um, than what actually um, is normally in the ocean, and it can cause a lot of issues for marine organisms that live in there. You can actually form salt lakes in there, which become very, very dangerous and toxic to them. And the other um, issues as well that you've got these big um, inlets where all the water comes in to the desalination plant and uh, marine organisms, fish, squid, all sorts of things can get pulled into those inlets and obviously get killed in the, um, in the process as they come through. So um, I'm going to stop it there and um, I'll go through this um, top on water in another video as well. In the next one, uh, we'll look at another way that they're currently looking to um, purify water, which is called thermal distillation. Uh, as always, if you've got any questions, just ask. And uh, if you haven't seen The Water Boy with Adam Sandler, really recommend you have a look at it. It's a funny movie, it's not his best one, um, but it is funny. Thanks, guys. See ya.